Tonight we'll talk about you know, how an operating system manages processes and then handling uh, what we'll call a piece of code called a critical section. So first of all, we talked about last class we had, let's say, in our main memory. We loaded our operating system into the main memory and the addresses will start at zero and then run our way up how big our memory system is. <coughs> and then we could take programs from our disk drive and load them into memory, user programs. So it's not part of the operating system. And we can have program one and program two, program three. Then maybe program two will finish, so this will be empty space. That's okay, now just program one and three are running. But inside the operating system, we have information about the program. So this part of memory will be the executable code of the program. And then in the operating system, we're going to record information about the program that's running. <coughs> so we're going to use what most operating systems refer to as a process control block. PCD. And then maybe some operating system try to change the name for it. But it's basically a piece of structured data that has information. So this is going to be in here. There'll be a little block of data about program one. And this could be the PCB of program one. And it's going to contain information about program one. So what are like some examples just off the top of your head? And as this course goes on, we'll start to learn more stuff that needs to go into this box. But what are some stuff that an operating system needs to keep track of of a program? So one thing might be the program's name, the process name. So that might be X number of characters, depending on your operating system. You might allow more characters than other ones. Any other information that you would need? So now think about what we'll, what we'll be doing is, since our operating system will be allowing one program to run for a little while, then another one to run for a little while, they're going to be stopping and starting again. So we want to keep track of what state they're in. So what's some other pieces of information we might need for programs that don't necessarily finish but are in the process of running? So we might need to know what the value of, let's say, its processor's registers are. Right, like we have the instruction register, even like the memory buffer register, the memory address register. <clears throat> Let's say we decided our processor has 16 registers. If we decide at a certain after a certain instruction to stop that process and let another one then take over the processor, all the values of those 16 registers have to be saved somewhere because we're going to resume and we need to know what they used to be. So how how could we record that? And again, this is an operating system class, so there's never a right answer. There's just you know, feasible answers and not feasible answers. And what are, what are some ways we could record, for example, those 16 registers? I guess if we know this exactly 16, we could take 16 numbers of spaces and just write them there. Um, if they were going to, for some reason, be expanding and contracting, and we wanted some flexibility, what could we do? Using, let's say, maybe pointers. We could get a block of storage and then say, here's the register pointer. So we could say something like register pointer. And then have it point at, and then we have to go and get another chunk of storage, which will also be in here, part of the operating system. And then maybe we could put the 16 registers here. 0, 1, all the way down to 15. So the register values might go like that. Or we can put all 16 if it's a fixed number in this block. The thing is, these blocks are going to be, might be moved around a lot, and that might be a bigger chunk of storage to move around. It might be easier to have this separate. But that's really a choice of the operating system design. <coughs> um, so we'll also later on in the course, we might have some programs have higher priority than other ones. So we might want to record its priority. You could use a system like the priorities, go 1 to 10, or you can come up with any system you want. But we're going to have to 
put some information about it. What other things does a program, does the operating system manage on behalf of a program that it might want to record? So that might be some resources that the program currently has control of. The program might have grabbed a printer and is in the middle of printing something and then it got taken off the processor, so it currently owns the printer. So we might want to keep track of resources that the process has control of. Now that's a good example of something that we don't have a fixed number, like it, it has to always control 16 things. That's not true. It could be controlling nothing. It could be controlling a number of things. So that's an expanding thing. Would you want to dedicate a fixed block of storage for all the things it could control? We might run out of room if this happens to be a program that controls a lot more than the average one. So something that expands and contracts generally has a, uh, a resources pointer and then we have a table of all the resources that it has. And then we can record everything it has control over at the moment. A program could be waiting for a resource that some other program has. So we might want to have requests. And that could also be, again, a data structure linked to another block of requests. We could have multiple requests that are currently unsatisfied. Anything else? Just like, and like I say, as the course goes on, we're going to realize there's more entries we have to put into this block of information about the program. But anything else just off the top of your head we have to keep track of? Um, for example, your program has a certain amount of space for its executable code, but then your program then starts requesting memory, right? Like if you have a Java program that does a new of a piece of storage, where would that go? You wouldn't get it out of your executable code. You'd have to get some chunk of storage somewhere else for your data. So this would be process three, not program three data. And then we have to have information about where that data is. It could be pointers to the area, or it could be uh, a linked list of pointers to the area. Again, it would be a data structure you choose to manage where the storage, the memory, for this program that it's generating and, and freeing, you know, that it's uh, getting and freeing would be located. So if at any given point in time we wanted to know what's the story of program three, we could go to the process control block of program three and that'll give us all the information about the program. Okay, so it's kind of intuitive, and then every operating system draws this picture a little bit differently. But it's uh, it's kind of intuitive that a the state of a program, and this is the simple version, and then we can add more states later on. Um, the state of a program could be the program is running on the processor, so it's currently executing on our processor, or it's in a state where um, it's ready to run, but someone else, some other program is running. And therefore it's waiting. Or it could be in a position where it is blocked from running because it needs some resource that's not available at the moment. So the state program, the state diagram of a process, can be new the, state, the states of the process can be new, meaning the operating system is in the process of creating it. It's loading it in from the disk drive, it's creating a process control block, it's building the linked list of resources and um, storage. So we could say a process can be in the new state, it's in the process of being created. Once it's in the new state, it could go then to the ready state, 
and it's ready to run. The operating system may then somehow take it from the ready state to the running state and put it on the processor. So then it can be running for a while, it can then go back to the ready state. While it's running, it may request some resource that's currently not available. So then it could go to a state, we'll give it the name block. can't proceed because some resource the operating system is in control of can't be granted to this program. So it could go from running to block. <clears throat> then at some point the resource that it's waiting for finishes, uh, becomes available. So then it would go back to maybe the ready state. And then the operating system could eventually say, okay, it's your turn to run again and it can start running again. Eventually, it runs to a point where it finishes, and it could go to a exiting state. So, kind of intuitively, you know that the operating system is moving the process around from state to state. This is kind of a theoretical map of uh, what's going on. But how could the operating system be doing this mechanically? What, what is the operating system actually doing mechanically to move these around? Well, the new state, it's, that's building the process control block for the program, loading the program from the disk drive into main memory, and then filling in you know, what memory location it has, getting space to record its processors, registers, and all that kind of administrative stuff. That's the new state while it's coming up. Once it's up and running and the process control block is created, how can the system, how can the operating system put it in the quote unquote ready state? Meaning it's, it's now ready, if you put this on the processor, it will run. Doesn't need anything, it's not waiting for anything, it's ready to run. What can the operating system do? And then once it's running, what happens? So generally what the operating system will do in that operating system section of the code, it will have a queue so it uses a data structure, a ready queue. And I'm drawing this kind of like a C or C++ pointer. Now, Java, if you're Java programmers, you probably, when you did your data structures classes, when your data structure, so all data structures are basically a chunk of storage that records some information, so you choose the structure of the storage and then somehow the chunks of storage are connected to each other. So in Java, you used a reference to the next piece of storage. I mean, you had, maybe you had a doubly linked list, so you had the next piece of storage in the previous one, so then you had to use two references. But you were using a reference to the next piece of storage. In C or C++, you used what was called a pointer. You got a piece of storage, and in there you can put the address of main memory of some other piece of storage. Either way, and, and behind the scenes, Java is using pointers to implement the references you view. But either way, we have the address of some piece of main memory storage. So the ready queue has the address of some piece of storage, and that piece of storage points to the process control block of some program. This is the block that contains information about a program. So maybe that's process control block A. <clears throat> One of the fields in our process control block is going to be a pointer to the next process control block. The next one that's, again, in, in the ready queue. So it's going to be a queue, an ordered list of process control blocks. And then it will have a field. This would be process control block for program G. And then G will point to the process control block. Maybe, okay, we'll do the process control block of program K. And then K will point back to A. So this is the ready queue. They call it the ready queue, but it's really a linked list. And 
it's a special kind of linked list in that the last element of the list points back to the first one. So maybe that's called a circular linked list. But they call it a queue in, in our textbook. So, um, when the operating system is deciding, the operating system will have one more pointer that is pointing at the um, pointing at the uh, executing program. So let's call that the executing pointer. And let's say the executing pointer is pointing at process G. So G is currently running in our system. The operating system will allow program G to run for a little while. When it times up, the next program that runs is the next one in the list on the ready queue. <clears throat> so the operating system will look at the process control block and see the address of the process control block for the next um, program that's considered running. And it'll perform a simple data structures operation of going to the next one. And this is the one that's now running. At this point, we're going to have a context switch. We're going to say this program, G, gets temporarily suspended, and then K gets put on the processor and starts running. <clears throat> so during that context switch, information about G has to be recorded in this process control block. What are the values of its registers? What's the last line it executed? What resources does it currently hold? <clears throat> that has to be recorded by the operating system into control block G. Then control block K <clears throat> is the way it was left off the last time it was executed. <clears throat> that information now has to be written back to the processor. So it can then pick up where it left off. <clears throat> so every time we transfer from program G to program K, there's a little bit of processing overhead that we have to deal with. But we don't mind paying this because hopefully there's a gain to allowing this multi-processing in our system. Okay, now suppose one of your programs is running, let's say K is running, and it asks for a resource, like a printer, and the printer is not available. Should we let this thing keep running? Well, it can't do anything, right? If the next step it has to do, the resource is not available, so it can't do anything. So we should get it off the processor. <clears throat> Should we just have the operating system go to the next process in the queue and start let this one run? That works for a little while. Then G will run. Then we're back to K, which is still stuck, and we'd be wasting time. So is there anything we could do <clears throat> so that we never go back to K and let it run on the processor if we know it can't do anything? Why load it back on the processor, just have it go um, stuck again, and then take it off the processor? So is there anything we can do, just playing around with these data structures? Let's say the printer is a resource and it has a queue, well, the printer queue. The printer queue has a pointer, which is currently, let's say, pointing at nothing. Is there anything the operating system can do so that as long as K is waiting for something, it doesn't have to waste time on the processor saying, yes, I'm still waiting. <clears throat> so one thing we can do is we can decide, well, this pro process is stuck. It's blocked. It needs to be, it needs a resource to become available. But after that, it can become useful again. So we could take the pointer to, let's say this is now, we said this was executing. If this routine is executed, and we decide that this routine, this process has become blocked, we can say, okay, who's your previous um, process? So we, we probably would want to keep, this. Would, we would want this to be a double link list, because we have to go back to the previous one and say, this one now points to where this one points to. We're basically trying to remove this block from the linked list of programs that are ready. Because it's now not considered ready anymore. It's waiting for something. So we'll put 
this pointer back to here. And then this process K moves to the end of the printer queue. And now this program is executed. So at this point, our, our operating system, if you were to take a dump of it and then said, what's going on? You could say, well, process, program A and program G are the two programs that are considered ready. At the moment, A is executing on the processor, which means G is waiting for A to time out. So then G could run for a little while. Then G will run for a little while. Then A will run for a little while. These are the two that are ready. This one is blocked. This one is waiting for the printer to become available. And once the printer becomes available, hopefully what the operating system will let do is play around with the pointers again. So you can go from running into the block state. While you're running, you ask for a resource that's not available. And the operating system plays around with the pointers, and now you've moved into the block state. <clears throat> Hopefully some other program that is ready and or running will eventually free up the resource you're waiting for. When the operating system detects that that resource is freed up, we hope the operating system will do this. It will go, take the item off the front of the printer queue and move it back to the ready queue. So it will go to the end of the queue and point this guy to this one and you have this thing joined back into the link list and now that process is considered ready again process K because the printer has now become available <clears throat> and then at some point hopefully your program eventually finished it successfully and when it finishes it successfully <clears throat> you, you, ex you execute your last line of code but there's still a lot of work for the operating system to do to get your program officially out of the system it would have to check that all the resources you've grabbed are now free, because you shouldn't be, your program shouldn't be able to grab up some resources and then forget to release them. So it should release them back to the operating system, the process control block, and all the link lists that come off of it, those, that storage all has to be freed. And then this is when your program's in the state of exiting. And then eventually you exit and you leave the system. Okay. So there's obviously a disadvantage to allowing multi-processing. That's where multiple programs are running at the same time. Um, but there is an advantage to it because let's say we had uh, let's say we had a program that let's say we had one program running and 70% of the time it was using the CPU, the central processing unit, which is made up of the ALU we were talking about, the, the, using the processor. Let's say 70% of the time it used the processor and 30% of the time it was waiting for something. Okay. So what percent, and, and if we let just this program run, Let's say we let our let's say all our programs did this. Seventy percent of the time they were executing on the processor. Thirty percent of the time they went out to the disk drive and they're waiting for a file to come in, and so it stopped waiting. If we let all our programs run sequentially, what percentage of the time will the processor be running, and what percentage of the time will it be idle? That's a pretty easy question, right? I'm, I'm giving you the answer. So 70% of the time the CPU would be running, and 30% of the time it would be sitting and waiting for whatever the program is waiting for. So the CPU's utilization would be 70%, which would be if this was P. Now, what if we let two programs with the same statistics, 70% of the time it's running and 30% of the time it's not, 
what is the probability that at, at any point in time they're both stuck waiting for something? 30% of the time, each one is stuck waiting. So it would be for two processes, it would be 30% of the time times 30% of the time, which is 9% of the time. Nine percent of the time, okay, C, uh, CP, CPU unused. CPU unused would be nine percent of the time. If we had two programs with these same statistics, I'm just making these numbers up. Seventy percent of the time it's on the processor, and thirty percent of the time it requested something that's taking a while to come back with an answer, like going out to a disk drive and getting a file. So if we had two such, pro so now if one is running and if one of them is waiting for something, we can let the other one run. So if you're doing that, there still might be a time when both of them are waiting and the CPU is not being used. But just having two running at the same time, we've gone from having the CPU sitting idle 30% of the time down to 9% of the time. But now we've introduced a new problem with that overhead of context switching back and forth. So maybe this is more like 10% or 11% of I'll consider the context switching part wasted time. We're not executing the program, we're adding overhead. But we've, with, by letting two programs run at the same time, we've cut our time wasting maybe down one third as much. And then obviously letting more, uh, letting more come in would be uh, three and four and five programs would cut it down to close to uh, the CPU utilization might go up as high as 99 percent. And that's really what we want in the end, the highest CPU utilization. To get our programs through our uh, system as quick as possible. Okay. So the critical section problem is uh, a problem where, okay, suppose we had two different programs operating on one resource. The resource could be a file, it could be a printer, it could be a piece of data. And if a resource was being shared, so let's say, let's say for example, we have two programs. Program one, let's make up an example. Let's say you go to a bank machine and you want to transfer $100 from your savings account to your checking account. So there would be a pro so you punch in some numbers and then eventually that kicks off a program that does something like this. Uh, savings equals saving minus one hundred. Checking equals checking plus one hundred. Some program like this is going to run. <coughs> now let's say a separate program run by the bank, program two, uh, wants to give interest to all your accounts, wants to give 1% interest to all your accounts. So, it says your savings account equals your savings account times 1.01, and your checking account equals checking account times 1.01. <coughs> so these are two separate transactions, two separate programs but they happen to be touching the same fields, your checking account and your savings account. So, if your checking account was originally, um, let's, say your check, uh, let's say your savings account was originally $100, and your checking account was originally zero, and you just wrote a check and you don't want it to bounce, so you want, you want to go to the cash machine and move $100 over. <coughs> if this pro program ran first, you would end up like this. You'd have $100 in checking, and then the program that gives you interest would change, change this to $101. Right? So that would be the result if this one ran first and then this one ran second. <clears throat> if this one ran first, and you can't really control it, you're, you're going over to the bank in the middle of the night and the bank's running their interest job also in the middle of the night, 
can't really control which one runs first. So, um, if this one ran first, you would have had $100 in savings. If this one ran first, you would have had 101 in savings. <coughs> and then this one runs second, you would have $1 in savings and $100 in checking. So depending on which one ran first and which one ran second, you get slightly different results. In one case, we have $1 here and $100 here. The other case, we have 101 here and zero here. Is there a right answer or a wrong answer? Not really. <coughs> so the data, one here and 100 here, or zero here and 101 here, those are considered consistent results with these two processes. It just depended on which one ran first or which one ran second. But, so we'll consider either one of those acceptable results. <coughs> now suppose this program ran and executed the first line, which would have done this, then got taken off the processor. Then this one runs start to finish. It gives no interest here and no interest here, and it's done. Then this one comes back and puts the $100 in your checking account. Now you've lost the dollar, right? The other two answers, as long as you have $101, it's okay. It's just which account is in, depending on which, which program ran first. But in this case, we've lost the dollar. <coughs> so technically, a section of code that uses a shared resource in your checking and savings account balance would be considered a shared resource. Two different programs are using the same resource and actually making use of it. It's okay if two different programs are reading from the same source, as long as they're not altering it. But if you start using it, then that part of your program that is using a shared resource is generally called the critical section. So what we might have to do is in solving the critical section problem, we're just going to write, for the purposes of this topic, we're going to write code that looks like this. We're just going to say we have code, we have to draw like a wiggly line, then I'm going to say critical section, and then more code. So what this means for a program, this section of code is making reference to some shared resource that we have to worry about someone else using simultaneous to us to get inconsistent results. So when we solve the critical section problem, solution to a critical section problem, we have to meet these conditions. Okay, so one will be when, when a process, we have to come up with some way that when we enter this code, other pro programs cannot enter it until we declare that we're done. So whatever we come up with as a solution, um, we have to say when a process uh, is in the um, when a process, when, when, or I'll leave this, I'll say this is simply a When no process is in the critical section, any uh, process can enter. Enters without delay. So we don't want to come up with a solution that says, oh, nobody's touching those accounts right now, but I'm going to make the one, the one and only process that wants to use it, I'm going to make them wait. That would be considered an invalid solution. Um, when two or more are competing for the critical section, this, okay, so if two or more want the resource,
one, whatever that shared resource is, one of them cannot delay the other. So like the one that gets there first cannot prevent the other one from entering uh, indefinitely. Okay, so suppose we wanted to solve something like this using a software solution. Not using any changes to our hardware and not asking for any help from the operating system. How could we like, so for example, the, uh, touching those two bank accounts, how could we have the two programs say, oh, wait a minute, I'm starting to make changes to the accounts and I don't want you to start until I'm finished. How can we do something like that using purely software? So suppose we had a piece of code that looked like this. Let's say we have two programs and we could expand this to more programs. But suppose we had a program, process one, and we said while, while one, which means looping forever. We say while There's a shared variable called process number. And that's going to be, so that'll be some shared variable process number. And let's say it starts off with a one. Process one is now running and it says, okay, while the process number is equal to two, I'm going to wait. So whatever we come up with as our solution, it's going to always have these properties. Before we enter the critical section, we're going to check, is it safe to enter? Because it might not be safe. Maybe some other process like that, the, the process that's updating, giving interest out, is in the middle of running, and it's not safe to enter. Maybe we should wait. So we'll always, before the critical section, we're going to check, is it safe to enter? And if we get an answer yes, then we can enter. And if we get an answer yes, we also have to lock out the people behind us until we say, it's now safe to enter. So somehow all, all our solutions will have a 
check before it, is it safe to enter? If it checks out, we enter, and then we let the others in. So here's an attempt at a solve resolution. So we decided we're process one, there's also a process two that wants to execute using the same critical section, sh sharing the same resource. So we say while process number equals two, we'll just keep looping over and over and over. And then eventually, hopefully that process will change it back to one and we can proceed. Then when we're done, we change it back to two. So then maybe they can proceed. So is this solution, you know, what's your comment on this? It does like some good things and some bad things. And let's say process two is written the same way. Process two would say if it's process one, I'll wait. And then when it becomes two, I can proceed. So whatever this value is set to, that's the one that's allowed to proceed. So unless you, it's set to your number, you cannot proceed. If it's set to the other guy's number, then you have to wait for them to run and finish, and then they'll set it back to you. And we can expand this idea to process three, four, and five. We'll just walk through the loop. But is there anything you don't like about this solution? The solving? Yeah, that's one, first of all, one thing is bad. This loop here, when this thing gets on the processor, it's going to say, is it me? No. Is it me? No. Is it me? No. That's going to waste a lot of time. So it's, run, it's, util, it's utilizing the processor, but it's not getting anywhere. So we call that problem. When, I, when any time you come up with a solution where you allow a process to run on the processor and it just keeps asking the same question over and over and gets nowhere, that's called busy waiting. The, the uh, processor is running, but it's going nowhere. <clears throat> it would be nice if we didn't have that. So that's one problem. And what was the other one? Were you, were you going to say there was another one? Oh, okay. <laughs> Anybody uncomfortable with this ping-ponging of one, two, one, two? It seems like it solves all, only process one can go first. That, because let's say we initialize the shared variable to one, only process one can run. When process one is finished, then only process two can run. This is a while, but maybe this is some resource that, maybe this is some program that's trying to do something over and over. And right now, the way we have it set up is, um, they alternate back and forth. Only process one can run first, and then process two, and then process one, and then process two. But maybe in the real world, maybe this thing needs to run three or four times, then maybe process two. <clears throat> so that makes sense that, that the way we laid this out, process, if, if there was a process two, it would be they would be ping-ponging back and forth. Okay. <clears throat> Let me go over a second solution. <coughs> Suppose we did this. make anything better. So we still have the busy waiting problem. We still have, we're checking something over and over. We have a shared variable called PS1 is inside and PS2 is inside. <coughs> and maybe we start off with, by saying, 
If the other one is not inside the critical section, then we declare ourselves inside, and then we can proceed. If the other one is inside, then we'll wait for them to no longer be inside. And then as soon as they're not inside, then we declare ourselves inside, which will block them from getting in. And then we can proceed. So this still has the busy waiting problem. That means we could put this on the process and it runs and runs and keeps asking the same question over and over and never gets anywhere. So I'm trying to just improve on the last one. Okay, so what we're basically doing here is we're saying we want to enter. We declare that we want to enter. Because last time the problem was we checked if the other guy had already entered and if, it, if they hadn't entered then we declared ourselves inside. But there was a, if we got off the processor between those two, we could give misleading information. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to say we want to enter, then we check does the other guy want to enter. And if the other guy doesn't want to enter, then we can proceed. 
If the other guy does want to enter, we wait here until they declare themselves not wanting to enter, and then we can proceed. <coughs> Does this seem like a better solution, or did this fix one problem and introduce a new problem? Does it seem, well, does it seem like an improvement over the last one? Because we, we declare ourselves, we can't declare ourselves inside, because we didn't do our check -in. So we say we want to be inside. Then we check, does the other one want to be inside? If they don't, we're, we can go through. And the other one will get stuck on this line. So we'll be able to execute in the critical section safely and they won't get in. I know both of them waiting still both of them. Right. The last time we had a problem where they could, depending on the timing, they could both enter. Now there could be a situation where they're both stuck. And how does that scenario occur? <clears throat> we declare ourselves wanting to enter. Then we time out. The operating system takes us off the processor right after this line, but before this line. Then the other one declares itself, I want to enter. Now, now we both declare we want to enter. Then it checks, does the first guy want to? Yes, he does, so the second guy gets stuck. Then the first guy goes back, and he says, oh, the second guy wants to get on, so I'm stuck. And now they're both stuck. That's what he meant, right? And this, they'll be stuck forever. And they'll both have the busy waiting problem, so they'll be wasting time waiting for the other guy to say, I'm done, and they'll never say that they're done. 